Thank you so much for uh, coming on our show and uh, talking about this fantastic book that I've had an opportunity to look through and do some research uh, beforehand. Um, before anything else, I should say that it was quite emotional to look through these pictures because it's a slice of life. It's, it's really a, a kind of a lost history that has survived almost miraculously. Uh, so I do have many questions about this. But before we get to it, I would like you to speak a little bit about how did you get into the subject of Armenian genocide? You clearly wrote numerous books, um, and you spent a considerable amount of your time and your talent sort of exploring this subject. What, what twinkled your interest about this? I think I have to go back to when I was a kid. I was sent to boarding school in England. I was probably the only uh, foreigner in a school full of English people. And for me, being an Armenian was something that was sitting on the, my left shoulder. And I'd go into the library. I'm supposed to, for instance, do history. The first thing I do is I look at the index to see if there's anything about Armenia. And growing up as a kid, I used to listen to my grandmother talk about the genocide and talk about her experience. And in her particular case, it was about how her family was saved by a Turk, not once but twice, the same guy, who I wrote a book about. You know, the Truth Will Set Us Free, uh, Armenians and Turks Reconciled. I wrote that because I said I'd write her book for her. It took me 25 years to end up writing the book, long after she was dead. But what struck me about when I got involved in that book was that when I did my research, I discovered the guy who saved my grandmother was a mass murderer. He was the one who was listed in the um, uh, British records as being a, a mass murderer, and he was listed in the Maltese, uh, in the Malta files of the British, which I extracted from the British archives in Kew. This is not a particular subject that I wanted to, to do, but it's almost kind of a compulsion. Some force beyond me pushes me to write about this. It really is not what I wanted to do. And these photographs are not what I wanted to do. Um, my mother asked me to clear out the house. After my father passed away, I bumped into the steel box, opened it, see these glass negatives, and I think immediately, how can I get rid of them? Um, not in the garbage bin of history, but how can I get pushed them onto an Armenian organization to, to be able to lift this weight off me. And I found the Armenian Genocide Museum in Washington, D.C., which was being talked about. It was just nascent. And in the process, we decided as a family to loan it to them because we didn't know if they were going to end up working or folding up. So we lent it to them. And for a period of about 10 years, they were struggling with litigation between the trustees and so on and so forth. So we kept hoping that they'd resolve it. And we waited and waited and waited. And ultimately, the project aborted. And I had to go and pick up these uh, glass plates from the museum and decided to, uh, to do it myself. Let's speak about the photographs themselves. Okay. Um, you kind of casually went through it saying that there were, your mother asked you to empty the attic. That in itself is already quite fascinating to me because in that attic were a historical treasure and this essence I'm holding in my hand. Mm. Tell us a little bit about how these photographs came about, how do they survive, um, okay. a story of the photographs themselves. Okay. The story of the photographs themselves is, uh, is a story in itself, uh, in the sense that um, Working backwards, uh, in 2003, when I opened them, uh, that's when the questions started coming out. You know, when did my mother get this? And I found out from her that her mother-in-law, um, Dr. George Jurgen's um, wife, gave it to her and her husband. Um, it, it gave a box of all these photographs, glass plates and other photographs, in 1956. She brought them down from Alexandria, Egypt, to Khartoum, Sudan, where we were living. And the reason she brought them down is because my father was the only one who had male heirs carrying the name Georgian. And so she brought it down and gave it to my mother. And people get on with their lives. You know, these photographs go in a box and they go into um, some room and they're left there. 
and um, it was there for about 20 years until 1970s and then there were political problems in the Sudan and uh, my mother left Sudan went to live in England and my father sent all his personal stuff our family stuff over to London what I found very interesting is that these are just pictures of people in everyday life they're living their lives they're happy they're going about they're fishing they're in their uniforms they're at the picnic table but of course we tragically know that many of these people will perish or be displaced and will go through the horrific events of Armenian genocide. What's the, what's the emotional content for you in this book? For me there's a sense of pride that I've done this. I've, these photographs have lain dormant for a hundred years and I've completed the work that my grandfather started. So there's a sense of achievement and a sense of fulfillment, a sense of you know, I've done something worthwhile. Uh, it wasn't what I planned out. I didn't plan it this way, but it's worked out that this way. And so there's a sense of satisfaction. Emotional in the sense that there's a kind of direct connection to my grandfather. We're kind of, I'm touching, I'm, I'm touching Your for past. a century. Yeah. And it gives us a connection to the way people lived, worked, how they dressed, what they did and so from that sort of in that respect we've kind of salvaged something from the dustbin of history we have an opportunity to see a slice of life and we to see Armenian priests to see the churches to see the schools to see how robust this community was how rooted this community was for thousands of years and then as a viewer you know you are reserved the right to have that kind of an emotional impact by seeing eye to eye to another human being to your ancestor I want to move to the presentation tonight. Tell us a little bit about the film. The film, again, was a complete accident. I never planned to do a documentary film, although I've studied uh, to do documentary films. I haven't done it for 20 years. So I decided that I would find a documentarian, a film videographer, who was reasonably new but trained in the industry and worked for charities. Um, and I found the person. A lady, a young lady by the name of Holly Harrington in England. Non Armenian. Non Armenian. And it, I think uh, having a non Armenian uh, help. help because there's distance, mm -hmm. there's objectivity, um, and there's also less emotion involved so that you could produce something that was probably more effective. And I told her about the story, and she fell in love with the story. And um, so we went out. This was last August, August 2014. And over a period of two, three days, we did most of the shooting. And then she came back and she said, we need some local shots of Arab here today. We need to inject some color. I said, well, I ain't going there. I'm a wanted man. Um, you know, my, my, my publisher in Turkey's in jail. I, ha you know, I have a wife and two kids. I ain't going there. Um, and so they said, well, we can get somebody in Istanbul to go out and do it. So we found somebody in Istanbul to go out and shoot. And we told him what we wanted. And uh, they did it. Wow. which was great so that as you will see in the film is um, is good but we then thought about we needed some music in the film. and I said I think the duduk would be an interesting Icon uh, iconic uh, music to put in I decided to approach a couple of duduk players and found one in Moscow and um, uh, his name is Argishti and he very kindly um, allowed us to select his selection of music on the internet and he sent us the pop files over. So we used his and we also used another Duduk uh, thing for the um, Erzurum Shorer music um, from Arax in Belgium. In any event, um, the music I think was, in, was forget the pun, instrumental yeah, usually is, usually um, in, in driving the story forward. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. I enjoyed it greatly. Um, Daylight After a Century, a wonderful book available on Amazon, I understand. Um, purchase it, look through the pictures. It's quite fascinating. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you very much indeed. My thank pleasure. you.